Hello, and welcome to the Virginia Cooperative Extension Plant Clinic, all about veggies. These plant clinics are sponsored by the Virginia Cooperative Extension Program of Virginia's two land-grant universities, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. So my name is Susan McCracken, and I'm going to be your moderator for tonight. Now, this evening, we'll start our clinic with Bug Watch. So Heather, this yeah. week, our Bug Watch is the ever-pleasant onion maggots. Yes. These are insects that I absolutely hate running into. Uh, what can you tell us about them? So onion maggots spend the winter in the ground. They overwinter there. Adults emerge in the spring and can range for up to a mile in search of host plants. So even if you don't have them now, no one is immune. The female adults lay their eggs at the base of the stem. And when the, the eggs hatch and you have the larva, they, they feed on the root of the plant which obviously for root crops such as onions, leeks, and garlic, it's, it's devastating. It can cause a total crop loss. The pictures here are the, the various life forms of the onion maggots, uh, the pupa, which overwinter, then you can see the larva and anything that has the word maggot in it, I just hate. So these are, these are pretty nasty guys. I think they're in an onion, maybe a garlic in this picture, and then the adult fly. One really interesting thing about the onion maggots is they're attracted to bright yellow. So if you want to see if you have them, put a bright yellow index card near your plants and the, they will kind of flock to it. So you can, you can see if you have them. Ways to control the, the onion maggot. A lot of things are similar to other pests we have. Um, rotate the crops to keep the population low. I do everything on a three-year cycle where I rotate through the garden. If you plant in late May, um, it might help because the soil temperatures can be high enough to kill the eggs. Cover recently planted seedlings with, with floating row covers. Those will, kind of, those will protect the plants from actually having the adults land on them and lay their, or lay their eggs. Beetles and nematodes are natural predators of the onion maggots. You can use pesticides, but make sure that you're not killing the, the natural predators that you already have in your garden. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, this um, was the least fun I've ever had researching a garden topic, I have to say. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't envy you the job of do, <laughs> doing that one. So hopefully our next one's going to be uh, a little more pleasant, a little more tasteful, shall we say. And Terry's going to talk to us about growing short day onions and garlic. Terry? I'm Terry McLean, and I'm going to be talking about onions and garlic. They are both, they have very similar growth patterns and they're in the same family and I'll be discussing that but most of my focus is going to be on onions and except for where I state otherwise most of what I'm going to say also applies to garlic. Okay so they are both root vegetables they're in the same family called allium and there's a whole lot of other things in that family too. Both of them are high in vitamins C and B6 and potassium so they're all healthy things. And in my opinion, they're delicious. And although you can plant onions as well as garlic in spring or fall, in our region, we prefer fall planting because they need cool temperature when you first put them in the ground. And then they need hot temperatures when they're developing their bulb. So fall is perfect because that way they get their cool period in. After you plant them in the fall, they start growing roots right away. But then the tops, the green tops that come above the ground, you won't see those until springtime. But they are under there growing the roots in the winter. And onions and garlic need just about the exact same things as far as how much light, what type of soil, what kind of moisture, what kind of fertilizer, and I'll be talking about those things. I had to learn a little about onions. I didn't realize that several things about onions that I'll tell you. So onions, they you put them in the ground and as I said, they start to grow roots. And then when the days become longer in the spring, that's when they start growing bulbs. If you plant what are called short day onions, they will only start growing bulbs when 
they're receiving about 10 hours of sunlight a day. And so for that reason, they are usually grown in the wintertime in the south. Long day onions need 14 to 15 hours of sunlight. So they're usually grown in the north during summer because that's the only time the north gets that much light. Day neutral onions, or they're also called intermediate onions, can form bulbs regardless of sunlight hours. And any of these types of onions, if they don't get at least six hours, they will just be green onions. So basically, they won't form bulbs. They'll just have the green part on top. And that's what a green onion is. I, I guess I always thought from groceries, you know, from the grocery store that green onions was a totally different thing. But no, they're just onions that have not developed bulbs because they didn't have the right amount of sunlight. If you are gardening in zone six or colder, I know we don't have a lot of people watching from far away, but we might. They should use long day onions, as I said before. Zone seven, which is where we are, and warmer should use short day onions. In zones five and six, they recommend day neutral onions, even though we can grow them here also. They can be grown pretty much anywhere. And mid-Atlantic gardeners, which we could fall into that category too, we can try all three onions and see which one does best. You know, there are microclimates in different, even within a small area, there are microclimates because of the building right next to the garden or wind that comes through and cools things off. So you might have more success with one type of onion when someone across town doesn't. And so the best thing is to experiment in your spot and see what works best for you. So prepping the soil for onions and for the most part also for garlic. Um, the soil needs to be loose and well-drained. So they do like moisture, but they don't like wetness, being wet. So um, raised beds actually are the best way to, to grow onions successfully and garlic, although they're not required, obviously. And crop rotation, which most of you probably already know when you rotate your crop so that you're not growing the same type of plant in the same spot year after year, which builds up more and more of that, the pests that like that type of plant. Using crop rotation methods can help reduce pests. And if you need more information about that, just Google crop rotation and it'll detail every detail about how you do it. Onions and garlic prefer neutral pH around between 5.5 to 7 approximately. And I highly recommend you test your soil and then given the results you get, amend your soil if it for the pH as well as whatever nutrients it might be lacking because onions and garlic are heavy feeders. They need a lot of nutrients and they use up a lot of nutrients to be able to develop those big bulbs. So it's recommended that even before you plant them, you add fertilizer, 10, 10, 10 fertilizer. They say four to five pounds per hundred square feet. So you would have to figure that out for your own garden, but make sure it's very fertile soil. Also adding organic material is always a good thing. But onions and garlic really like a lot of fer fertility in their soil. So adding compost, aged manure, well-rotted sawdust or peat moss. And then what I do is I use a cover crop. I usually, I've tried all different ones, but the ones I've been using mostly lately are ryegrass and clover. And what you do is plant it in the spring and then let it grow and then chop it down and just let it dry on top of the ground. It kind of makes a mulch and then also the nutrients, it feeds the soil. And then you till that in in the fall when you're gonna plant. And then you do another cover crop in the fall and it does the same thing over the winter and then you till it in in the spring. And that way you're constantly adding more organic material to your soil. When you are ready to plant, which, for our area, it should be between mid-October to mid-December. There are hundreds of varieties of onions and garlic, so depending on which one you choose, it may take anywhere from 85 to 120 days to maturity, which means it has developed the bulb. For onions, say, you plant sets, and you may have seen these in stores. They look like little tiny 
onions that that are kind of just dry that the, the bulbs little tiny bulbs you buy a package of them usually or sometimes they're loose and you select the ones you want with garlic of course if you've seen a head of garlic you know it separates into cloves you will separate those cloves and plant those instead of the sets for onions you can also do transplants but i think sets is the way it's recommended for onions and seeds you can't really use in the fall because it when it gets cold they won't be established enough their roots won't be established enough they're too tiny they'll probably die over the winter so in, if you're doing fall planting, which is what I'm talking about tonight, you're going to use either sets or transplants. Um, and you're going to put them in the ground with the little pointed side pointing up. And if you look at the opposite side of it, you'll see there are just a few remains of tiny roots. And those go down. Otherwise, you're going to end up with strangely shaped stalks. And cover them with about an inch of soil. Mulch over that with straw or glass grass clippings or leaves and um, just like mulching for all plants it reduces weeds protects the plants from the weather like wind and cold and it helps retain moisture and depending on what you want if you want green onions the ones that don't have the bulbs about two inches apart about four inches apart for bulbs and eight inches apart for large bulbs if you are using seeds in the springtime it's suggested to plant them more thickly than that and then thin them down to those separations and you can eat what you thin. So, Garlic has a few specific things. One is you shouldn't really use garlic that you've purchased from the grocery store to plant in your garden. For one reason, it's probably the wrong variety meant to grow in different climates and so it might not be very successful. Also sometimes they treat them with chemicals either to prevent them from sprouting in the grocery store or to prevent pests and diseases or they might have disease or fungus none of which you want in your garden. And also when you're planting the, the garlic cloves with their skins on, you don't peel them by the way, um, try to choose the biggest ones, the medium to large ones, because the very small ones will produce very small heads of garlic. And so you want the bigger sized heads of garlic. So choose the bigger sized cloves. So caring for them during the active growth period, that means when they're starting to develop their bulbs. In other words, when the daylight hours are whatever they, they require. So the bulbs will start developing. You need to hand pull weeds as often as you can get out there, at least weekly. Because of their shallow roots, both onions and garlic can't really compete. If there are a lot of weeds around them, they will really suffer. They won't get nutrients or enough water because of their shallow roots. And water very consistently once every couple of days if it's not raining, not waterlogged. As we said before, they need drained, well-drained soil, but they need moisture. If you do not keep them pretty moist, they'll end up being quite small. Fertilize, you have to continue fertilizing through the season because they are using up so many nutrients to develop their bulbs. And high nitrogen fertilizers are recommended. 3300 is what VC rec VCE recommended. And then when they start, when the bulbs start getting bigger, they pop up out of the ground, kind of like radishes or beets. And so you can kind of see the tops. If some of them, you can't see the tops, you should just use your finger and brush off some of the dirt to expose just the tops of them, because that'll help prevent them from rotting because of the mulch sitting on top of them. Because of the fact that you have to keep the soil so moist, that can be too wet with the mulch. There are some pests that like onions and garlic. The onion maggot, which we spoke about before, which also becomes the onion fly. Thrips, which are a type of little flying moth looking thing. There are various rot, bulb rot diseases that sometimes hit garlic and onions. And then there are some rodents, voles, field mice, Interestingly though, deer do not like them. And some people even recommend planting garlic or onions around flowers and other things that do attract deer to ward them off. So they are actually anti some 
or critters. When it's time to harvest, which is around mid-July, maybe into August, depending on the variety, your climate conditions of your garden, the last couple of weeks, you should stop watering because you want them to dry out a little bit so that when you harvest them, they're not starting to rot. Because once they stop developing their bulbs, they're just sitting there. And then if they stay wet, they will start to rot. And the way you can tell they're ready to harvest is when the tops, the little, the green sprouts that are on top, turn brown and start falling over. They probably won't all fall over at the same time, but the ones that have fallen over are ready to harvest. You can pull them out. And after seven to 10 days, if some of them are not turning brown and falling over at all, you should pull those ones too and just use them immediately. They won't store for months the way the, the dried ones might, but they're still edible. They just are too moist to try to store for long storage. With garlic, the time to harvest them is usually a little later, closer to late July or August. And of course, I'm giving you a window because of variations with different gardens and different variations of plants. With garlic, dig them up when the lower one third of leaves turn brown, but there are still a few green leaves, five or six maybe. And they, just like onions, will rot if you leave them in the soil too long. And the way you dig them up, or one way, a uh, recommended way to dig them up is using a pitchfork. Just gently put it in next to where they are. Obviously, you don't want to pierce them with it. And then gently pry them up so that they pop up out of the soil. And hopefully if the soil is, is dry enough, they'll pop up. Some people actually recommend lightly sprinkling with water right before you harvest, like moments before you harvest to soften the soil enough so that they don't get bruised or damaged as you're pulling them out of the ground. I haven't tried that because my soil was not bone dry so that it was hard enough that they wouldn't come up. But if your soil is very, very dry after not watering those last couple of weeks, try sprinkling water just before you harvest them. And if you're trying to get green onions, which we said before, the ones without the bulbs, you can harvest them whenever you want, but around six inches tall for the, the green sprouts. Drying and curing onions and garlic. Drying and curing are two different things. When you dry them, what you're doing is getting the moisture out of them, whatever moisture is left in them. So pull them out of the ground, lay them on something that allows air uh, flow, like chicken wire or a mesh screen, or uh, if you do composting and have a one of those frame with a screen in it, if you have something like that, you could lay it on that. Anything that will allow air circulation and leave them in the sun a couple of days. Don't wash them because remember, you're trying to get them dry. They'll have some soil still on them, but that'll crumble off once they're dried. If your area that you're putting them in is moist, you can point fans at them to try to increase air circulation, but try to put them in a warm, dry area. In the sun would be great if that's not possible because of weather, put them in a, a dry part of your house. Then cure them, which means store them in a dark, but also dry place for one to two weeks. And you should check them frequently to make sure they're not rotting. If there was any moisture anywhere, they will start rotting. And again, this is going to be in, in something that allows some airflow. Some people put them in a brown paper bag. Some people put them in a mesh bag, but in a dark spot. And this actually improves their flavor, increases their flavor, and increases their shelf life for later. So after those couple of weeks of curing, brush off any soil that's still stuck to them. It'll just crumble off because it'll be very dry by this time. Uh, any loose of the paper skins that's on them, you can pull off leave some of it though to protect them and then cut off the tops so that they're you just leave about an inch of the browned tops above the bulb and then they should store for months store them in a dry cool area such as a garage or a basement and a lot of people recommend hanging them either from a mesh basket in a mesh basket from the ceiling or in a mesh bag. Hanging them just helps 
increase the air circulation because now air can get under them as well as on top of them. I have mine in a stacked metal baskets that are stacked so that they're not, so that I have layers of them. So they're not piled on top of each other, but there's one single layer in on each level of the basket. And here's something that I learned. Don't store your potatoes near your onions. I have always done that uh, because onions emit ethylene gas and that makes your potatoes sprout and then spoil more quickly. So I have moved my potatoes away from my onions. And also garlic, for storing garlic, after drying and curing it, it can be stored in the house on your kitchen counter. It does not have to be in a dark place. And I used a couple of different books and several different websites. So you feel free to do more research and find out more about onions and garlic. Basically, if you've grown one or the other successfully, you'll probably be able to grow the other successfully because they're very similar. Terry, thank you so much. That was really great information. Uh, I, I think I've taken onions for granted. I didn't realize that there were, you know, the different kinds like that. So that was really helpful. I, well, I have a question. When it comes to drying the onions, you know, you said lay them in a warm, dry area. Because they're like big, would you, do you have to cut them like or anything? Or do you just Do lay you the mean, full yeah, no, the full onions. If okay. you cut them open, that's going to introduce places for bacteria to get in and then they're going to okay. run. So okay. yeah, whole onions with the skin still on and with the tops still on, okay. let them dry for a couple of days in a su hopefully sunny spot. If you can't do sun, then warm, but the main thing is dry area. Okay. And then do the curing in also a dry, but dark area. Okay. And Got it. Then cut off the tops, but don't at any time cut the onions, the bulbs. Okay. During that Thank process. you. Mm -hmm. And then my next question is, so you said um, don't plant garlic cloves that you get from the grocery store. Would you just get them from like a farmer's market? Would that be the next best place to get them? That's an interesting question. Um, you can usually buy them at a plant store, the ones okay. that are meant for planting. I am not sure if you would want to plant the farmer's market ones or not, because Hopefully, if they're from a farmer's market, they're from our region, so they would do well in our area. I guess, depending on the farmer, I don't know if they would use chemicals or treat them at all. Most farmers that grow at far farmer's markets, I'm sorry, this is Becky, are, um, they have to produce within 150 miles. That's the typical okay. standard for most Fairfax County farmer's markets. So you are going further south, you are going further north, but it's pretty regional. But also, you can just ask the farmer. I personally grow. Uh, garlic every year. I don't typically save most of mine back. I eat it and then I gather new garlic and I get mine from Potomac Vegetable Farms here in uh, Fairfax County. And I just buy their biggest cloves of garlic. And you can always ask any farmer what their growing methods are. And I mean, I know other farmers that buy their seed from Potomac Vegetable Farms. And there's also a lot of like, you can get it at Tractor Supply and you can order it from like Johnny Select Seed or like Seed Savers. There's a lot of sources. I mean, garlic is one of those niche things. People get real excited about it. And there's all kinds of varieties out there. If you just look up like Virginia garlic, I'm sure you'll come up with lots of sources, but the farmer's market is absolutely a good place to start. Okay. Yeah, I forgot to mention that if you do grow garlic, you save some of it and if you save some of it you can then plant cloves from that garlic head for the following year thank you becky for mentioning that unless you've eaten it all which is probably right. what i would do and then i'd have to go buy some more cloves <laughs> right <laughs> exactly which is why i collect new every year but also yeah. i have found that my heads don't grow as big as the ones uh -huh. on the farm and so i like to collect new ones each year so i can plant those larger cloves Makes sense. Good point. Great questions. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Terry and, and Becky and, and Emma. Thank let's, you, everyone. Let's, let's move on and we're going to let Sonia talk to us. Sonia Berdia is going to share some very timely information. I'm going to be anxious to hear this about harvesting and curing winter squash. Take it away, Sonia. 
Okay, great. When we're talking about winter squash, it's not the zucchini and the yellow zucchini squashes that we're talking about squash, such as butternut squash and Hubbard and delicata and acorn. So the harder squashes. This is my squash vine that's taking over my patio. This is an acorn squash vine. So you harvest winter squash when the squash have a firm rind and they're fully colored. You shouldn't be able to stick your fingernail in the rind. The color is mature. And then also you'll find that the vine dries up around the squash. This time frame is usually September to October. And in the photo, you see an example of how the vine itself and all the leaves have dried, dried up around the squash and that squash is ready to be picked. Try to allow two and a half inches or so, two to three inches of stem to come off with the squash. And that stem helps prevent rotting at the stem attachment. And you should experience a nice snap of the, of the squash stem off of the vine when you, when you break it off. These two squashes are also ready to be picked. When you cure winter squash, what curing does is it hardens the skin and it can also heal any cracks or scratches in the skin. When I read about curing, it was funny because it depended on the region that the, the information was from. So some papers said to leave it out in the sun at 68 degrees and some said up to 85. So I think the idea is essentially to leave them outside in the sun for a couple of weeks in a single layer. And then you wanna turn them over every few days and then you leave them outside for about, about two weeks. So there's a couple exceptions to curing squash, acorn squash and delicata squash. And here's a little acorn squash from my garden. They, they do not do well with curing. So you do not cure them. They, the flavor will be decreased, diminished, and it affects the shelf life as well. So those are the two exceptions. The rest of them, pumpkins, Hubbards, butternut, those guys, you want to cure those. And then once they've been cured, you want to store them in a cool, dark place like potatoes you want to keep them away from ripe, ripening fruits that emit ethylene gas, such as apples and pears, and we just learned onions. Acorn and delicata cannot be stored as long as other squash. They are good for up to six weeks, and other winter squashes can last for several months in storage. And these are my references. Thank you. I have to admit, I my problem is being patient enough to let that butternut squash cure, even though I know that's the right thing to do. But I was really glad to hear what you had to say about delicata, that we don't cure those, because I was thinking we did. But those are better fresher. Sure. Very yep. good. They're a very wonderful thing to have in the fall, and then it's gone. <laughs> okay. Good to know. Good to know. Thank you. I have delicata and butternut. And I'm excited about both this fall. So I'm, I've had one delicata, no butternut. So I'm looking forward to them. All right. Thank you very much. We have been working on this garden journal all, our, all, all series long. And the advantage of a garden journal is to help you remember what you planted, when you planted it, to help you monitor what's going on in the world around, in and around your garden, what bugs showed up, when they showed up. We have encouraged people to use this garden journal, and we found one. Uh, it's Microsoft Office Garden Journal. If you haven't used one, if you want to take advantage of it, this is a pretty cool one to use. And that now, at this point in the year, we're you know our gardening is our gardeners are starting to wind down a little bit, so it's important to record what we're seeing, how things have grown, what we need to do differently next year, and maybe some of the fall maintenance stuff we need to be doing now for for our garden. So our last program, we'll actually talk about our garden journals and um, hope that you'll join us for that one. So 
to find additional resources, including a lot of great articles, weed profiles, and more information, visit fairfaxgardening.org. Now, we've been hosting all of these plant clinics since the summer of 2020, and every one of them was recorded. And so we have a whole library of recordings on our VCE Fairfax County YouTube site. So go there and visit. In addition to ours, you can see all of the Lunch and Lawn series. We've done, you know, a fall and a spring series for Lunch and Lawn and all of the garden uh, Zone 7 garden series. A lot of great speakers, a lot of great topics, a lot of interesting videos that you can watch. So we hope that we'll see you at another program and we appreciate you being with us tonight. Have a good evening. <music>